All right, and we are live here, uh, not from Calvary Church, but from Amber Carswell's house in West Memphis. Uh, so glad uh, to be here, glad to welcome Rami Shapiro. Where are you coming from, Rami? I'm coming from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Live. How's the weather? Not much different from yours, I imagine. It's <laughs> wet and blowy and thunder and lightning during the day and more to come tonight. Yeah. So apologies in advance for any of y'all tuning in with us tonight. If things go terribly wrong, we have a hero in Robin Banks who will swoop in and explain very kindly in the chat that things have gone wrong. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're watching our internet connections with um, um, a little bit of uh, uh, worry and consternation, but nevertheless, we are pressing on. Thanks for being here, Rami. It's well, good to see you. Amber, my pleasure. I'm looking forward to this. Have you been doing uh, any other sort of traveling or uh, virtually with, with places these days? Yeah, virtually, <laughs> virtually. I mean, my, my career for the last 15 years has been on the road yeah. all over the world, and that stopped abruptly. And now I do Zoom or other things like this one, Restream, mm -hmm. Re Restream. But yeah, the restream seems to handle my my very spotty West Memphis internet connection a little bit better uh, than the Zoom than the Zoom has done in the past. Well, this is my first time on restream, so you know <laughs> I have nothing to compare it compare yeah. it to. Really, I can't really I don't know enough about it to compare it. But that's not what you wanted to talk about, is it? Oh, no, <laughs> no, no, that's but about all I know about technology. <laughs> We've got a, I don't about know. I four minutes to, to explore whatever we want with technology. Have you been? Um, uh, what's w w any interesting places you've been speaking to lately in terms of? Well, you know, I I do some. Uh, the work is okay. Wait, I, I'm trying to figure out how to say this in English that it doesn't come off really, really conceited. I, I do a lot of work for this organization that is amazing. The organization is called, is called um, Global Peace Initiative of Women. And for the last 15 plus years, uh, they do conferences around the globe. And I've been traveling with them around the globe. And wow. now that we're all you know stuck using the internet, uh, but they're still doing some amazing work. They bring together some unusual characters from the environmental community, from the spiritual community, and have conversations that you don't have normally. They're all free flowing. There's not a, you know, with rare exception, uh, is there a moderator that's uh, asking questions? Sometimes they ask me to do that, but it's just an amazing, an amazing community of women and now men that mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like it. It's really quite quite impressive. So I've been doing a lot with them, and then just you know, different churches, synagogues, uh, retreat centers that are still functioning you know, using the internet instead of in person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's most of us these days. Yeah. Um, um, if you're just joining us, uh, I'm Amber Carswell. I'm one of the priests at Calvary Episcopal Church in downtown Memphis, Tennessee. And uh, I am here with Rabbi Rami Shapiro, who uh, I will introduce properly in just a couple of minutes when we get started at 6.30. Hope all of y'all who are tuning in are uh, hanging in in this weather, and uh, we're glad to see you here. As we, as we get started and um, this conversation keeps unfolding, we hope you'll send in your questions, your comments in the chat. If you're here now watching us, let us let us know you're here. Uh, we see some 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 familiar faces, some familiar names, Zeta and Heidi, Heidi and Edward. I don't know if you've had the pleasure of 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 meeting Edward yet, uh, but uh, uh, Edward is Heidi's littlest one, uh, not so little anymore after we've missed seeing seeing him grow over the past past year. But so Amber, you're not actually seeing faces, are you? Uh, not uh, just their little profile pictures. You're, you are because uh, I'm not seeing anything. Yeah, there's a little chat in my version of this. 
uh, on the side in a yeah i have that but i don't there's no photograph it just says facebook or something else oh fu weird yeah i've got their i've got their profile pictures well i'm sorry i don't I'm sorry too, because these are some very fine faces around Calvary Memphis. <laughs> you wouldn't know, but there they are. <laughs> Abet's here. Peggy Owens here. She's excited because she heard you at noon. Yeah, you were preaching at noon today. Yeah, via sort of. Well, you were preaching yeah, pre, at pre-recorded, <laughs> pre-recorded preaching. Hopefully, it was interesting, Peggy. I hope I hope you found it worthwhile. It was, yeah. Uh, tohu wabohu and and. Uh, uh, did I say that right? Say it again. Tohu vavohu. Vavohu. That's yeah. right. Um, and it, I, I went back uh, to to view it tonight before uh, you logged in, so I could try to figure out um, the the people uh, behind you uh, in your in your screen. One of them who is Doctor Strange, uh, uh, and then I just found out the other one's Alan Ginsberg back there. So, uh, fan of Alan Alan Ginsberg. Yeah, it's a pretty eclectic background. Yeah, got, all the basic. Well, not not all of them. I'm waiting to find some other things, but there's a Hindu thing, and obviously the you can't tell, I don't think, from the camera, but that is not exactly Jesus on the cross. I can't tell. It just looks yeah, like a it's right. It's Mary on the cross holding right. Jesus. Oh, uh, I, yeah. I got that as a gift from uh, some some. I led an interfaith group to Israel a few years ago, and we were in this Palestinian craft workshop, and they had that, and a couple of people bought it for me. It's, you know, it's it's the crucifixion of the mother as well as the child. So I found that I find that very meaningful. That's beautiful. I've never. No, I've, I've never seen anything I've like seen it. I've seen a lot of you know the Theotokos, the you know the sort of priesthood of of Mary yeah, holding. Yeah. The the child, mother of the universe, but not uh, in the crucifix. So yeah, wow. that's. Let's see which way is which. <laughs> okay, I gotta, I gotta like do the opposite. Where it is? Okay, so right over this shoulder, this shoulder. <laughs> that's um, Theotokos holding the earth. That's the mother holding the earth in her arms, oh, and above that is another mother um, icon. Um, I think. No, over that is a Kabbalistic icon okay. uh, called, called a Shiviti, which means um, I place the divine before me always. So there's there's a mix. There's Muslim, Hindu. Uh, there's some stuff, for, but but my own and the Zen circle, the Enso on the side. But my primary interest, besides Doctor Strange, is in the the Divine Mother. Nice, wonderful. Well. I have a couple of minutes after 6.30 here, so let's go ahead and get us kicked off in an official manner. All right, you ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Welcome to the Calvary Podcast. I am Amber Carswell, one of the priests here at Calvary, and I am so honored to welcome Rami Shapiro with me uh, in conversation tonight. Uh, Rami Shapiro is an author, a poet, an essayist, a teacher, a rabbi. He's a graduate of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, and he also holds a PhD in religious studies from Union Graduate School. As a rabbi drawn to ha ha Hasidism? Hasidism? Yeah, Hasidism. Hasidism and Kabbalah and a practitioner of perennial wisdom found at the mystic heart of all religions, Rabbi Rami Shapiro's message is simple. Alles is Gott. Everything is a manifesting of God. He is inspired by anyone who dares to step outside the safety of sacred opinion to experience and perhaps utter truth beyond isms and ideology. Love, he says, is a reaction to images we hold of others rather than to the others themselves. And with this in mind, Rami prefers to meet others as they are rather than love them as he imagines them to be a worthy goal for all of us, I think. Thank you, Rabbi Rami, for speaking with me this evening. It's my pleasure, Reverend. We're gonna go, we're gonna use Rabbi Rami, then I should call you, you know, Reverend Amber, 
Or we, you can just say Amber and Rami works fine. Amber and Rami works for me. Okay. <laughs> it's worse if you did mother. So uh, uh, <laughs> thanks for, thanks for uh, defaulting to the rest. <laughs> oh, so I would love to just start out with maybe for folks who don't know you at all, who are unfamiliar with you and your work, can you have just a little uh, something you can say to tell us about yourself and, and, and your work and uh, kind of what brings you to this table today? Yeah, sure. Um, I grew up in an Orthodox Jewish home and I found it primarily meaningless. I mean, my loyalty to Judaism was my loyalty to my parents, basically. Mm -hmm. And when I was in high school, junior, senior year of high school, there were two teachers who had gone to India over a summer break, my sophomore, junior year, on a grant. And they came back and they taught classes in what they called Asian civilization, basically Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. And I just fell in love with the, even though they're all very different, I they were all the same to me. It wasn't Jewish. It wasn't Christian. It wasn't Muslim. I was hooked. Mm -hmm. And I followed that, got a, my, my focus, though I did Judaism as a minor, Buddhism was my focus as an undergrad, went to grad school in Buddhism and found it horrendous. It was so academic. I was interested in, in you know, enlightenment, not in academia. Yeah. Um, and at one point, my Zen master, uh, said, told me I was going to have a terrible time in grad school uh, with you know, studying Buddhism in grad school. And he said I should move with him back to his monastery and learn Japanese from him because he spoke very little English, learn Japanese and study Zen on the cushions rather than in the classroom. And I knew I didn't want to do that. I, I, I'd been on several retreats. I'd visited the monastery. I knew it was too rugged a lifestyle for me. If I'm going to go to the monastery, I need hot and cold running water, showers, flush toilets. I'm not going to rough it. And um, I blurted out to him, I, you know, he he's this short, but very, he's deceased now, but short, round, imposing character. And he had backed me against the wall and told me this. And I said, Roshi, I can't go to the monastery because I'm going to become a rabbi. And he said, oh, good, be rabbi, be Zen rabbi. So I said, okay, I'll be a Zen rabbi. I didn't know what it was, and I didn't even have any plans to go to rabbinical school. But I guess my subconscious knew better than my conscious mind. And I, I, I moved into the rabbinic world looking for something equivalent to the experiential practice, to the practice and the experiences I was having in, in Buddhist uh, temples. And I found it, but you have to really look. I have to find it in the Kabbalah and the Hasidic tradition, mystical traditions of Judaism. And that's sort of the, the path I went. But over the last, well, I don't know, 30 years, 20 something years, I've also been drawn to the divine feminine. And I've had numerous experiences, both um, auditory and visual of the Divine Mother in different forms. In the beginning, it was Mary, and then it it morphed into other other forms, Kali and uh, Shekhinah in Judaism, Chachma Sophia in, in the book of Proverbs. And she has been my, I, I really have no interest in God the Father, <clears throat> but I am drawn to and have, I don't know if intimate's the right word, but I've had intimate encounters with God the Mother. And yeah. so that's where I am. And, and in, be, you know, in between, uh, I discovered from my, my Rebbe, my guru in Judaism, Reb Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi, the whole concept of uh, perennial wisdom, mm -hmm. that these four common truths at the heart of, at the mystic heart of all religions. And so my philosophy is the perennial wisdom philosophy, and I can explain that to you if you want. But my philosophy is perennial wisdom, but my experience of the divine is through the mother. Interesting. Is it too personal? Uh, but I'm about to ask it. Like how I have n never met a high school student who was drawn to meditation in the first place, right? Like that uh, to, to this of the, as your part of of your experience strikes me as as quite remarkable. Um, and I wonder what it was like, I mean, in an Orthodox Jewish home, I grew up in a home that was very sort of like laissez-faire, you know, there's no real guiding structure or principle to a religious life. Um, 
in, in a home like mine. Uh, but one that, like yours, which was, yeah, I mean, it's orthodox. Um, what was it like to enter into um, these explorations of Asian religions and Zen Buddhism? Yeah, well, it was, you know, it wasn't welcome. <laughs> you know, my father, my father hated it. Uh, my mother took a different approach. Like part of the appeal. <laughs> right, I mean, it could have been just a rebellion thing. Um, but, you know, my, my dad thought it was just nonsense. Mm -hmm. And my mother thought I was some, I mean, literally, you can read this in my book, The Holy Rascals. One night she came into my bedroom and asked in all sincerity if I were the Messiah. Because she <laughs> couldn't figure out why I would be interested in all this religious stuff if I weren't some you know, some anointed being. So, uh, you know, so I mean, I, I, I was, I lied and I told her I wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, but, but she was serious. She, she was very serious. And when I said no, she started crying. She, I don't know if she was crying because she thought how cool I'm the mother of the Messiah or, and now I'm not, and I feel bad. I can't tell my friends at Mahjong or, you know, she was just, overwhelmed by the question i guess i'm not i'm not really sure we never talked about it after that that's amazing i love that she did that my parents were like why are you going to church <laughs> <laughs> very confused at the whole prospect yeah. of, of a devotion to uh to religion so yeah really really interesting so um it occurred to me that as i was planning our time together that if i had tried to list all of the books that you have written um, and published so far in the writings, I'd spend most of our hour together uh, naming them off. Um, and there was a sweet line though in one of your biographies that said that you um, considered writing as your first love. Um, would you share just a little bit about discovering that love for yourself? I discovered that I, that I wanted to be a writer uh, in seventh grade, I had this wonderful English teacher who, you know, like everyone else, you made you, you had your weekly vocabulary list and uh, you have to put the, the new words in sentences. And I would spend hours crafting the mo I, what I thought were the funniest sentences I could come up with. And I just loved uh, writing and being then, I mean, they, they weren't reading what I wrote, but writing and, re and reading aloud what I wrote so they could hear it and getting the audience reaction. I knew I wanted to be a writer from that point on. Uh, mm -hmm. I think on a deeper level, my brain works in, in such a way that writing helps me figure stuff out. Mm -hmm. So, which is not so great because writing in English is linear and there's all kinds of issues around that, but that's how my brain works, I guess. And it's just when I have a thought or, or even, you know, if I have some kind of experience in meditation or something, I oftentimes can't articulate it even to myself. And then if I'm going to try to understand what happened after it happened, then writing is the way I do it. Um, but you know, like I said, I've written 36 books. I don't know how much, how many essays and other things. But I, I, if I don't write, I mean, there are three things I do every day. I meditate, I walk, and I write. And if I don't do those three things for a couple of days in a row, I feel, feel physically ill. Mm -hmm. I, something is wrong with me. So mm -hmm. I have to keep doing those things. I don't know if that really answers your question, but um, oh, I can't, I can't help myself when it comes to writing. Well, that's really, I mean, to say that it's a part of the tool of, of your being able to communicate the mystical experience that you have, um, the way of processing that. I think one of the things that's really difficult, right? Like we're all, I mean, um, all of us who are involved professionally um, in religion have had um, these moments which have shaped and formed us. I mean, as you alluded to earlier in this, your experience of the divine feminine. And the problem becomes like how you, how can you communicate that? The, the mystical experience, because it breaks you out of the thing that you have known and what is predictable and you're getting this insight to the unknowable, right? Like it defies even writing, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Like it defies your 
relating it to another person. Um, it defies being captured. Um, and that's what that's what I've found to be true about this this relationship between the two. I would love to tell you about this, but I can't. Why not? Inquiring minds want to know. Why can't oh, you tell us? Oh, well, you mean you mean it's just impossible to convey because it's ineffable. Exactly. I, I thought I thought you were keeping a secret from us that I needed to know. Oh no, I'm an open <laughs> book. I'm an open book about my mystical experiences. They sound, but when I tell them, they sound so mundane, right? And of any course, person, of course, yeah, they all person, sound. I was sitting in the woods, and suddenly I had this feeling come over me that the, you know everything was was actually one in the universe, right? Like, yeah. um, no, that's right, that's right. So, but you have to. I, I mean, my sense is the experience itself is ineffable, and then in my experience, you have to f it, right? You have to you have to share it. You have to articulate it. Um, I only have one. Yeah. I only have one teacher left. Um, maybe that I have, I have, I have friends who are also teachers in different traditions, but you know, when it comes to like guru, like characters, mine have all died with one exception and he's in his late eighties. So yeah. I don't know how much longer I'll be with him, but being able to articulate the experience in, in this case to, to him really helps not validate the experience. I mean, it was my experience, but helps me go deeper into what it was. I mean, a few maybe it was before COVID, so maybe it was two years ago. Uh, my teacher's name is Prasanna, and I went to visit him. He doesn't have, he doesn't do retreats. He doesn't have followers. You, you can't find him on the internet, I don't think. Um, but if you know where he is, he's, you can work with him. So I went to visit him in his house, and, you know, he's, we're talking about my experience, and I'm, hopefully he's helping me understand what's going on. And at one point, he just asked me a question uh, in response to something. He, he, he said to me, you know, so what is your meditative practice? And it was a stupid question because he knows what my practice is. And the part that relates to him in particular, he's a disciple of Ramana Maharshi, is Ramana Maharshi self-inquiry, where you, you, you ask yourself the question, who am I? Or if there's a thought that comes up, who's thinking this thought? And if the feeling, who's feeling this? And you realize there's a larger consciousness. Uh, in Judaism, it's called spacious mind behind the narrow mind of the ego. So I said, well, you know what it is. I practice, you know, uh, self-inquiry. And I said, I asked myself, who am I? And then he said, are you? And I, I disappeared. I mean... For the first time in my life, because I've had that Rami's gone experience, but this was the first time that there was awareness without an awarer. <laughs> there was there was a consciousness, but there was no person being conscious. I couldn't speak. I could see everything, but I couldn't label anything. I was just present, I guess you could say. It's, there's no language for it. But I was simply present and absolutely silent inside and outside. And then it passed after a while. And I said to him, what did you do? What was that? And his response was, I'm tired. You should go now. <laughs> that was it. That was the last time I saw him. So uh, so partly I, I, I talked to him and others when I had them to, to help me understand my experience. And then in this case, I, though I didn't know what this was going to happen, and that's not why I go to see him, the teacher can ripen my experience beyond what I was doing before, just by her presence or, or his presence. Mm -hmm. So so having a teacher, though, though I don't like gurus necessarily, I think the guru system is broken. It's filled with all kinds of misogyny and, and abuse and uh, there's and patriarchy, especially because I'm talking about male teachers here, mm -hmm. uh, though women teachers are not necessarily exempt from sure. from the the exploitation but that that system i think is should should die out but still that means there are st still great teachers who just don't claim the absolute authority of a guru but there are still great teachers who can help you i don't know what help you your help you mature in your spiritual awakening or I, I mean I don't I don't know the language for this so I'm, I'm very lucky to have had a number of these individuals uh, men and women
but he's the last one. Everyone else has died. That's so, I mean, it's so poignant to hear you say that. Um, and I wonder how you find your own role, you know, changing from, you know, student to, to, to guru or student to master. Um, yeah, I, I used to think a lot about, you know, being the next generation, you know, in, you know, that, that they, I, I'm, I'm going to be in my 70s, or I am in my 70s. Um, wow. Do I take on that role? It's not my role. I mean, I, I teach, uh, yeah. I write, and I do all these things, but I don't want the responsibility of actual students who hang on my every word or expect something from me that I can't, I can't do. So I teach how to meditate, I teach all kinds of things, but I only teach what I practice. I only share what I've experienced. And the underlying, I mean, the underlying philosophy is what you said earlier, Alice is God, everything is a manifesting of the divine. But mm -hmm. the message of my work is don't follow me <laughs> because I'm <laughs> as screwed up as everybody else. Don't, <laughs> don't give me that. I was once with, um, uh, Reb Zalman, Reb Zalman Shakta Shalomi, who was my Rebbe, my guru in Judaism. And I was, this is, oh, I don't know, in the 80s, maybe the 90s. I was visiting him in Philadelphia when he lived there before he moved to Boulder, Colorado. And we're sitting in his apartment and there's a knock on the door. It's just about lunchtime. There's a knock on the door and he opens the door and there's a, a kid there in his late teens, early 20s. And he says, I really need to see Reb Zalman. And Reb Zalman says to him, Reb Zalman's not here. I'm going out to have lunch. We're going to go get pizza with, with Rami. When I come back, give me some time and I'll be Reb Zalman and let's make an appointment later in the afternoon so you can be with Reb Zalman. Right now, I'm just a guy going to get a pizza. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was perfect. I love that. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's true. I mean, in in I would think in any sort of, of role, I mean, whether you're a teacher or a rabbi, a, a priest, or a, a parent, right? Like, I'm not the parent right now. <laughs> I'm not the one uh, you're looking for. Um, but a priest is a more loaded vocation, don't you think? I mean, you yeah, can do well, you do stuff. I, I mean, you're you're a um, you're not a Catholic priest. I know that Catholic priests can do things that no one else can do. You know, they have magic powers. Um, they, in Episcopal, in, a, in the Episcopal Church, I don't think it's the same. But tell me. Um, well, it's a little. It's it's different in the way that the church defines what happens at communion. So um, we do say that um, that we're in the line of the apostolic succession, right? When the Church of England broke broke from um, the Catholic Church, um, then it was still along those lines of the same people who had laid hands on other people, continuing down. Um, but in communion in particular, we say that uh, we're very, we're, we're not so mm, defining uh, in, in what we believe there. We are, we are resistant to dogma. We are bound by our prayers. Right when you say about this that you're a you're a God uh, doer and not so much a God thinker, some some of that rings true in terms of you know we are not bound by the things that we think, but the things that we do, um, and that is prayer and the Eucharist. Um, and so uh, we we leave a lot of allowance in that by saying that when the Eucharist is consecrated, the very presence of Christ is in it. Now, if that means to you the body and blood of Christ, sure. If that is a, a God being active to you in the memorial of this uh, reenactment, well, there you go. I mean, and everything in between can kind of fit uh, in, in that definition, whoever comes to the table. So it's a little different, but good question. But what you said earlier reminded me of the, uh, you know, the I'm not the, I'm not the I'm not the teacher. Uh, the the sort of if you if you see the Buddha in the road, you should you should kill him. There was a a a, a book that a professor of mine wrote that if if you wrote if you met George Herbert in the road, you should kill him. He, and he George Herbert was the perfect pastoral priest from back in the in the in the 16th century um, that everybody thinks of when they think of what a priest should be. Um, and they said and he said of course dismantle that. So. <laughs> 
Uh oh, have I? Lo I've lost your audio. Has it? Have I lost it for anyone else? Robin, is it good for you? Can you hear? Uh oh. Um. Yeah, we have lost Rami's audio. Oh dear. Going so well. Um, Rami, do you want to check out your, your your microphone and sort of maybe just do a running commentary of <laughs> while you're doing that? Um, <laughs> uh, I see. Oh, okay, I hear Zeta can hear. Sharon can't. Edward can't. Um, so it looks like it's not just me and Robin, though it might be Zeta. Um, Why don't you, um, yeah. oh, now. there you're on, you're on, you're on. Whatever the program is, it defaulted to something else. So we, All right. should, we, we should be fine. Well, that's actually a really perfect transition <laughs> to, uh, uh, um, I, I really wanted to spend some time talking tonight about one of your latest uh, books, uh, which has to do with your um, exploration of the 12 step uh, recovery process. Um, you wrote a book lately called Recovery, the Sacred Art, the 12 Steps, a Spiritual Practice. And as I understand, another one's going to be coming out, is coming out. Uh, another one has been out for quite a while. It's called Surrendered. Those are my, Surrendered, surrendered. yeah. Those are my two books on 12 step. Gotcha. Well, Maybe you, I, we could start out talking about that as what, you know, what led you to the recovery movement? I mean, specifically the 12 step program. I, I'm, I gather there are other ways of understanding the recovery process. Was this yeah. something you had known of from other experiences? Did you enter as a Well, I, I knew about it, but, it, yeah. but I'm an addict. So that's what brought me there. Mm -hmm. So I went with a friend uh, who was a drug addict and an alcoholic. And uh, she had we had she had to go to a meeting. I had never been to one, and I said, "Can I go?" And because I'm just curious, and she said, "No, absolutely. Just when you qualify, you go around the room and you say, "Hi, my name is Rami. I'm a, in my case, I'm a compulsive overeater. I'm a food addict." And uh, when you go around and qualify, just say, because it was an AA meeting, really. You know, she said, "Just say I don't know if I'm an alcoholic, so you're not lying." the fact that i've literally never had a drink <laughs> you know i don't know maybe if i did i'd be an alcoholic so i don't know so she said just say you don't know so we went in and we ran out it's a big group of people my turn came up and i said i don't know if i'm an alcoholic but that meant to all the alcoholics in the room that i was clearly an alcoholic in denial and they spent a lot of time trying to help me you know face my my addiction yeah. um I loved the experience. I loved the meeting. I loved what I learned in that just that first time. I was so impressed with the quality of the people, their honesty, their mm. their oh, the rawness of of what we were doing. And then afterwards, I was talking to my friend about. It. I said, "This is great." I, and I said, literally, I said, ah, "I wish I had an addiction so I could go." <laughs> she said, "What are you talking about? You're addicted to food." And I said, "Oh, that's ridiculous. I am not." But I am. So I went later on my own to a, a Overeaters Anonymous meeting just to see what they do. And, you know, people were telling their story. And I'm saying to myself, wait, that's an addiction? I do that. Doesn't everybody do that? <laughs> and I realized that, no, I, food is, is my problem and has been forever. Yeah. So I was drawn to it because of my own, my own addiction. But when I was in it long enough to really not to get over the newness of it, to realize how it actually worked, to, to work this, the, the program, I realized that the quality of the conversation regarding the program was very shallow. Okay. That, um, you know, we would listen to these tapes and we would have conversations amongst ourselves on the 12 steps. But it seemed to me they were much deeper than what people were allowing the steps to be. And then I started looking at, well, what if, what if you didn't have an addiction? Or maybe everyone's addicted. What might everyone be addicted to? And I decided everyone's addicted to the self, to the ego. 
yeah. to that narrow mind. And then everyone can experience rock bottom when that narrow mind fails to live up to the promise that you're going to be happy and you know all that stuff. And I started to look at these things from what I considered a deeper perspective and then saw resonances of, within the 12 steps in a variety of religious practices. And then I wrote the first book on recovery to, to pull all that together. But the key is that Bill W said uh, in the early, early days of AA, he said, the first thing is to stop playing God. And that to me is, is key because the ego does that. The ego, you know, is, is, uh, is the God character in our lives. It sort of directs everything and, and tries to control the world. Uh, and, and not playing God is, to me, takes a lot, takes a, a much deeper engagement when the, with each of the 12 steps than I was getting in my regular meeting. I still love meetings, but I had to write a book. Of course, it's not, it's not accepted in the meeting. It's not, it's not an official 12-step book. But okay. I, I needed, like I said before, I needed to work it out and I ended up with this book. And then years later, I felt I had missed something. Um, and what I had missed was the, the, the importance of being surrendered. I mean, mm -hmm. I understood surrender, you know, as a verb, something I could do, but being surrendered myself uh, was something that we, I, I don't think I've ever heard talked about in uh, 12 step meetings and yet it started to to speak to me as a more uh, profound understanding of what i had been experiencing in these meetings so very simply what i have in mind by being surrendered versus surrendering being you know i i turn my addiction over to god as i understand god uh, i surrender you know my my life in in into god as uh, as i understand god the problem with that is number one, if I could really surrender my addiction, I wouldn't be an addict. Right? Right. I don't have that power. And number two, the God of my understanding is just an extension of my ego. So there has to, I, I think, there has to be a God that I don't understand beyond my ego uh, mm -hmm. understanding. And that God is the, you know, like in the opening uh, chapter one, verse one of, of Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao. So the God that can be understood is not God. Mm -hmm. It's just the God of my understanding. And so, so the, in that sense, even though you work the steps, ultimately the steps work you, I think. And you're continually brought to rock bottom in order to be continually surrendered to the divine. And that's the healing that 12 step offers. But it doesn't tell you that directly because if it did, you'd never go to a meeting, right? It gives you agency, do this. But in fact, it's about, uh, I don't know if you wanna say removing agency, but it's about, it's about having you cracked open when you hit rock bot bottom and it's the grace of the divine or the universe or nature or mother, or however you want to understand it. It's it's that grace that is the healing power, and that's the grace of being surrendered. Don't know if that makes sense, but it does. A shot at so it. much, yeah. So much of it lines up with that, um, with the I don't know this overlap of what you've already been talking about in this. You know the the when when you became not Rami, right? right. Um, when you had vacated in a way that let you see something true in the world that wasn't being colored through, you know, the, your your own eye lenses, right? This is and this is something that that religion is all about, and um, this act of of surrender, you know, that people get confused about idolatry in the Hebrew scriptures as this sort of oh they just thought there were all these other gods, but there's something true in that about these idols trying to capture the divine, right? Yeah, well, but, we make the idols. So the idols reflect yeah. our effort to capture the divine. Yeah, God and, made in our image, yeah. Yeah, God is made in our image rather than the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, and religion, you know, with all due respect to those who are religious, religion is just another example of that. I mean, we invented the religions. Mm -hmm. they, they weren't, I mean, they, they all claim to come from God in one way or the other. 
But mm -hmm. the God they come from is the God of the understanding of the people who organize the religion. And that's mm -hmm. why the religion always reflects the, the biases of the people who created it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if a woman created Judaism, it wouldn't be so misogynistic, right? It wouldn't be so patriarchal. But, you know, men created it. So it reflects their, their biases, their quest for power, their understanding of, of or lack of understanding of women. Um, so re religion isn't the answer. The answer is to use religion as a, I don't know, a vehicle for getting beyond religion, I guess you, you might say. I was going to say, said by said by the man who um, has deeply pursued, I don't even, I probably couldn't count on one hand the number of, of religions. Of, of religions. Oh, well, I'm, I'm fascinated by religion. I mean, I taught comparative <laughs> religion at MTSU for 10 years. <clears throat> I, I studied it. I mean, I, I love religion. I'm fascinated by religion. And, but what, what attracts me to religion is what, what I call the perennial wisdom at, at the mystic heart of every religion. And there's, there's four points, so let me just lay them out. I mean, the first one is everything is a manifesting of the divine or, or one thing, if you don't like the word divine. Everything is the manifesting of one non-dual reality called by many names, you know, God, Allah, nature, mother, spirit, whatever. Number two is you and I, human beings, have an innate capacity to awaken in, with, and as that aliveness. The third is when you're awake to the aliveness, you're called on a very visceral level, not commanded, but, but internally directed, maybe better than called, to living according to the golden rule, for example. And your mission in life becomes uh, what it says in Genesis 12, 3, to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, all of them, not just human. And then the fourth point is awakening to this aliveness and being a blessing comprise the highest calling of the, of the human being. So I think though every religion articulates this in its own way, the mystics of every religion articulate this in their own way, uh, <clears throat> the core is, is the same. And mm -hmm. that's what attracts me in all these religions. What I really, I'm fascinated by the differences on the surface but I'm in love with the practices that lead you to this, the awakening that everything is the happening of God. And it's, it's interesting, you know, it's just to put that into conversation with the 12 step recovery process, right? That something of this experience of the rock bottom um, or the emptiness, um, the lack of self, the dark night of the soul um, is being, explained on a sort of everyday level, right? You think of the dark night of the soul, and I think of the people who have reached such like spiritual heights um, that they have the gift of God <laughs> um, <laughs> abandoning them, um, right? Like that yeah. there is something of this, as you further, you go further up and further in, that you reach, you reach these empty places. Yeah, I mean, what's the last thing in the, in the first gospel, not in the book, but in you know chron chronologically, the gospel of Mark, the, the last thing, the only thing that Jesus says on the cross is Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. And so he hits rock bottom. <laughs> you know, that's his dark night of the soul. And without that, there's no resurrection. So, you know, I look at, at the, the Jesus story as, uh, archetypal that I was once once with Father Thomas Keating and we are in a panel together and someone was really giving him a hard time about whether the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ was um, necessary to every human being's salvation, meaning if you don't believe in that, you can't get saved. And it was an inter interfaith panel. I'm sitting next to him. He didn't want to say that. So at some point, you know, he sort of said, well, let Rami answer this. And I said that, yeah, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is absolutely necessary to everybody's salvation. Necessary, but not sufficient. Mm -hmm. You have to be crucified. You mm -hmm. have to go through the same thing. If you just let it, and of course the religion is Jesus does it for you, but I don't, that doesn't work for me. No, take a, if you, if you want to be my follower, take up your cross and follow exactly. me. Exactly. And there's only one, you know, when I teach that, to my, when I was teaching at MTSU and I would teach that passage to the kids, you know, we talk about what does that mean? And they thought, well, we all have problems. We all have, you know, difficulties. But 
when Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, there's only one place you go in the cross, and that was to the, the hill of crucifixion. So yeah, if you want to be a follower of Christ, you have to be crucified. You have to go through that dark night of the soul. You have to be buried in whatever state that is, and then you can be resurrected. Um, so, um, and I think that's very similar to what happens in 12 step. You, you hit rock bottom and something, something happens that brings you out of it, but it's not a once and for all thing. I think, <clears throat> I think, um, it's, it's a continual, I mean, you, you, one of, one of my 12 step teachers said, it's not, don't think of the steps as ascending, think of them as descending. And yeah. you you start at you know the you're you're at rock bottom, and then you end up working the steps, and then you fall a little more until you hit yeah. rock bottom again, and then you try again and you hit it again, until eventually you simply surrender to the whole, or maybe to the whole with a capital W. Uh, which, if if you don't mind, in the chat, um, most people are just talking about whether they can hear us or not. But somebody <laughs> says, "Could you? Could me? Could I?" expand a bit on the word non-dual of all the, of all the things god may or may not be why stress that one so i don't know why i stress it but it's the best definition i have of understanding what uh to help people understand what i mean by god non-dual means not to it's advaita it's a sanskrit term and it simply means that there isn't anything else but god in deuteronomy the phrase is ain od milvado there's nothing else but the divine um and, and so the imagery that uh, the Hindus use, which I find very helpful, is the, the analogy they use is the analogy with an ocean and a wave. God is the ocean and everything else, you and I and inanimate, if there is such a thing as inanimate objects and animate and sanctioned and non-sanctioned, all existence are, wa uh, are waves of that ocean. So that just as, as a wave is not all of the ocean, no wave is other than the ocean. The ocean is all of every wave. So it's the same with God, though you are not all of God, God is all of you and you are nothing other than an extension of God. That's what non-dual means when I, when I use that term. Good, thanks. Good question. Well, to, I mean, to think about, you know, I'm just curious about your experience within the 12 step program, because one of the things um, that you hear leveled as a criticism against it is this sort of necessity and the belief in the higher power or the divine or the one or whatever, however you would put it. Um, and you yourself have a capacity for belief that allows you to embrace all sorts of manifestations um, of that divinity. Um, what I mean, what would you have to say for those folks who, for whom belief at all is a struggle? Um, yeah. Well, first of all, I don't like the word belief. So, sure. So they, to me, to me, belief is affirming something you have no idea of whether or not it's true. Sure. Sure. So you know, I, I, I don't believe I have a sister. Mm -hmm. I know I have a sister. I believe she's home with her family, but I don't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't believe in God. I experience mm -hmm. God in this sense of non-duality. In 12-step, the language, I mean, it's, you know, it's from the early 20th century. So the language is um, dualistic. The language can, can be, I mean, I can't say it's really Christian because Bill W. is very unhappy with pastors, even though it comes out of a Christian milieu. So in, in the group that I uh, started with here in Murfreesboro, there was a guy who was an atheist and sure. we were told, look, you're looking for something greater than yourself. He said, the group is greater than me. I, when I turn my, you know, when I look for support in my, in my working the steps, I look to the group and that works. So yeah, the language uses God a lot, but I think, and I don't know this for a fact, so I'm, I'm just, guessing slash projecting. I think <clears throat> that may be changing because more and more people see the value of 12 step who, and these people don't have a traditional God concept. So that, it, so it may be changing. I hope it's changing. I think it will be more effective if uh, the language can be adapted 
to be more more inclusive. But you know, it's um, for lots of people. It's it works the way it is, and they they don't don't muck around with it. That's why you're only allowed to read sanctioned literature in those rooms. You know, it's th there's a real concern that of, of an orthopraxy. You know, there's just one way to do this, and you otherwise it's not going to work. And I don't feel that way necessarily, but you know, I, I would understand where that's coming from. <laughs> I would be surprised if you did uh, feel uh, strongly about an orthopraxy. Yeah, no, I just think uh, it's the, it really is the one critique that I hear um, kind of over and over about uh, this because, you know, uh, it's mostly, I, I have not had personal experience um, with uh, the 12 step, step process and my family hasn't been, um, you know, affected by addictions in the ways that you would traditionally define them, right? Like right. addictions, uh, all working out in, in socially sanctioned uh, or maybe less immediately destructive ways uh, than drugs or alcohol or, or, or what have you. Um, um, but to say that, you know, it's, uh, it's the, the concepts there are so powerful and I feel very drawn to the, the language of, of, the surrender to the thing that is larger than you, um, which is larger than the group to me, right? Um, yeah, me too. Uh, so what, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, was, I was really interested to ask you about that in terms of- Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I would just add one more thing. I mean, the group here in Murfreesboro, uh, they were all Christians. And so the, most of them, I mean, there was this atheist guy, there was me, but for most of them, their higher power is Jesus. And mm -hmm. they made, Mm -hmm. that's who they talked about all the time. Mm -hmm. So if you're, I mean, I, I can talk about Jesus. I, I, I don't care what name, you know, it's Jesus, Kali, Krishna, you know, I don't care what name for the deity you prefer. I'm comfortable with, with all of them because I see all of them as limited and all of them at their best pointing beyond themselves to that non-dual reality. But uh, so I don't have a problem with people using Christian language, you're speaking about Jesus, and I can, you know, I can enter into that conversation myself. But um, if you can't, and if you have a thing about this is this is too religious, you know, in this in a in a narrow Christian sense, then I see, yeah, it's it can be problematic for people. That's I mean, read my book and you'll see, look, there's Buddhist stuff, there's, you know, so mm -hmm. I, I tried to take it out of that uh, context. And the response to the book was huge. Yeah. Uh, so that there's a lot of people who are looking for that. Uh, not so much the surrendered book. I don't, it didn't, it didn't hit the same, um, the same chord, the same nerve that the, the first one did. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's for, I mean, in, in my life, in the life of the church, right. I mean, these, these recovery groups are just a, are a part of, of, uh, you know, unfortunately, right, the 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 trope of the the church basement rather than a, a nice you know sunlit area uh, with, <laughs> good, but um, but that's it's always been a part of uh, around us and what we do. Yeah. People come yeah, in. We're just we're just grateful for the space, so <laughs> we well, can live with the basement. So you're in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, uh, and you're part of these groups. Do you? Okay, so do you know other liberal Jews in Murfreesboro? Uh, is there a community that you can find there um, of like-minded folks? And what's it like? What's um, what's a what's yeah. Murfreesboro like for you? That that's a difficult question. I know there are other Jews in Murfreesboro, but there's no community. Uh, yeah. Every once in a while, there's an attempt to have people come together for holidays but that was pre-COVID. Um, yeah. Whether that will start up again or not, I don't know. I, I tend to, I mean, my, my, my son and daughter-in-law and, and my grandson live here. And so I would go to these things if they would go to those things just to be part of the community. But I don't really have a need for community at this point. I like being alone. COVID didn't impact the lockdown. I was like, I don't have to go out. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> so... It, it's you know it it fed my my uh, introversion, um, but there is no real Jewish presence here in mm -hmm. in Murfreesboro. Mm -hmm. uh, there's 
anti-Semitism I've bumped into, but there's no real, there's no, there's no Jew, real Jewish community here. Nashville, Nashville and Memphis too. Nashville has a very strong Jewish community. Yeah. Well, I just wondered, I just th thought of, thought of you and, and, and just the embodiment of you out in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And I thought, yeah, oh, well, I, I didn't, I didn't move here for the Jewish, I didn't move here for the Jewish community. Yeah, well, true. True. <laughs> I, I, mo I moved here because my wife's mom was dying. So yeah. we, we came to help her make that transition. Yeah. And we just never left. Well, a worthy, a worthy move for sure. Uh, Heidi asks, um, it sounds like continuous honesty is a key practice of recovery work. What role or not does honesty play in spiritual or religious practice? Are there any similarities between the two? Oh, I love the, the first statement, Heidi, that continuous honesty is a key practice of recovery. Absolutely. B, I mean, that's what drew me when I first went to that AA meeting. They were so honest. I would say that the same quality of honesty should be central to spiritual and religious practice, but it's not. Hmm. Um, I mean, how many people feel comfort comfortable being honest at a synagogue or a church or at, at a mosque or a, a temple? I mean, I was once, just to take it outside of the Abrahamic traditions, I, I was once teaching in India, which I've done a number of times, and I was talking about the Jewish uh, pen ancient for arguing. It's part of the Jewish tradition and you challenge your rabbis and you see that in the New Testament all the time when the Pharisees are challenging, testing Jesus, that the implication in the New Testament, because it's political, is that this is an insult to Jesus. But in fact, that's the way rabbinic Judaism works. You're always questioning the teacher. And so I was giving this talk and afterwards, I don't know, a couple of dozen swamis came up to see me uh, to say, how could we do that in our religion, and I don't didn't have an answer for that, but in most cases, honestly saying, I don't believe this, uh, can really put you on the outs. So I think we squelch our honesty with regard in a religious setting. And then in spiritual settings, which are more, let's say, contemplative focused, spiritual practice focused, I think there's still a less obvious dishonesty when we keep putting the ego back into the center of things and and saying oh this is my experience or somehow owning owning mm. it in a way that I, I don't know if i'm really explaining this well but but the yeah. honesty and spirituality is to say really i don't know and ultimately i'm not who i think i am and uh to challenge in, in Hindu, in Sanskrit, it's neti neti, not this, not that, to continually be honest and to say, no, it's not this. This is a great idea, but it can't be that because it's my idea. And whatever the reality is, it's beyond the naming, like Lao Tzu says. So yeah, it's central to 12-step to in, in the sense of being honest about myself and my addictions and my secrets uh, in those rooms. It's not blabbing them to the world. Uh, but it's less, much less so, I think, in religion because you get socially ostracized. You know, in a 12 step, the more honest you are, the more love you feel, ideally. Yeah. But in a religious context, my experience has been the more honest you are, the more ostracized you become. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, just to maybe beat the point here, but I used to do a lot of work with the Methodist Church in their phenomenal retreat program. And a lot of times, young seminarians would come on these retreats. And I remember having lunch with some of them saying, you know, we, I was talking about the Bible in my program there, my presentations, we learned the same things in seminary, but we were told they don't preach. You can't preach those things because if you do, the congregation will be very angry and you won't be able to work. And I said, I think you have it backwards. I think people are really looking for that honesty. Mm -hmm. And if you could tell them the truth, the truth isn't, isn't, going to destroy their faith, I think the truth will enrich their faith. But you have to be honest. But, you know, they said, I'll lose my job. And I've heard rabbis say the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I think in in Christianity, um, there's a, a 
we have this right of confession, right? Where you come and you just bear all. Um, and that's really fallen away uh, in terms of a practice beyond beyond Catholicism, where it's sort of like, you know, you've got to do this in order to do this. Um, and one of my professors in seminary said, um, you know, uh, everybody's got therapists now. They don't need to uh, be honest with other people around them. They just funnel it into uh, a, a professional to, to help them. Well, that's, yeah, that's true. But I don't think therapy and spiritual guidance are the same thing. Oh no! I, yeah, it's, so so I think being honest with a, a priest or being honest, if if the priest can handle being you know honesty, uh, is is really important. Can we just because I know we're going to run out of time, but yes. Catherine and Jill have some interesting yes. questions here. Well, Catherine has a comment. It's for you, really. I feel fortunate to be in Calvary because it accepts honesty and questioning. So yeah. amen to that, Sister yeah. Catherine. Thanks. And, and kudos to you for, for her saying that. And then Jill says, do you think it's possible to outgrow 12-step meetings? Yes and no. I think like my experience was the people weren't going deep enough. So you could say, well, then you can outgrow it. Uh, and maybe you can outgrow a meeting and find a more deep meeting. I mean, I was in some suburb of, of DC uh, with this this AA group, uh, actually it was a it was a mix of of twelve step people, and there was no way to outgrow that one. <laughs> they were so brilliant in their in their honesty and their spiritual wrestling with their addictions. It, you could only grow into it, never out of it. But I don't think you can outgrow the twelve steps. But yeah, I think you could outgrow any given meeting. I mean, I I'm always looking for a deeper, not, not, this is not a criticism of my meeting, but of the meeting here in Murfreesboro, but I think you can always look for a deeper, a deeper one. I mean, I, I try the phone. I do phone meetings, uh, especially now because I don't go to meetings because of COVID. Uh, so I don't think you can outgrow the 12 steps because they go as deep as you can go, but you could outgrow a meeting. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I, I knew a guy uh, in in the last place I worked. I mean, I think he went to maybe five of them a day, five or six of them, and it was it was like he he was replacing, you know, like I get something different from all of these different experiences of these groups, and they all offer something else. So um, it's always kind of struck me like when I, uh, you know, oh, I can. Yeah, sometimes though you can get addicted to meetings. I don't know this guy, so. Well, I, uh, that's part of what ran through my head, but I wasn't going to say it. It's good yeah, <laughs> I mean, some people need it because they 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 need that support because you know it's not day by day for them; it's hour by hour. <laughs> it's not one day at a time; it's one yeah. hour at a time. Is what I mean. Yeah, 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 for so, sure. So maybe that's what he needed. But I think you could also get addicted to meetings. Um, it's like well, when you when you when you're love bombed by a community, you can get addicted to that because it's so. I mean, it's very rare that you walk into a place that's really non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's hard to describe if you haven't if you haven't done it. Now, you can actually go. At least this was true in Murfreesboro. Um, we would get calls from nurses. We would get calls from social workers who who weren't didn't have a brand named addiction and asked, could they come? Uh, just to, to experience what some of their clients uh, were experiencing. And we always let them in. So it's beautiful. Well, thanks, Rami. We have reached the end of our time tonight. Uh, you have been listening to Rabbi Rami Shapiro in conversation with Calvary Episcopal Church for a part of our Lenten preaching series and Lent After Dark. This episode of the Calvary podcast as part of our Lenten preaching series, a nearly century old tradition that invites wise and inspiring speakers into our pulpit during the season of Lent and onto our podcast Beyond Lent. The Calvary podcast Lenten preaching edition is produced by Noah Glenn of Perpetual Motion. Our theme music was composed by Spence Bailey. Special thanks to Robin Banks, Director of Communications at Calvary, and Heidi Rupke, Linton Preaching Series co Coordinator. Thanks to all of you for listening, and thank you, 
Rabbi Rami for being here tonight. What a pleasure and a joy it has been to have you in conversation. I, I enjoyed it myself, Amber. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you at Calvary. Thanks. Stay well and safe uh, over there in Murfreesboro. And we hope to catch you again some, one of these years at the Linton Preaching Series. Anytime.